Okay, so I'll be talking about an 18th century book genre that's known as the extra illustrated or Grangerized book. Um, you'll see that there are two names that it goes by, Extra Illustrated and Grangerized. And I'll be talking about it from the starting point of the 18th century. Um, and I'll talk about why I'm starting from that point later on. And I'll be comparing the 18th century Extra Illustrated book with artist books. Um, and when I'm talking about artist books, I'm referring to a particular type of artist book that's known as an alt, the altered book uh, from the 20th and 21st century. So why am I bringing these two book forms together from widely different um, historical origins? Well, they're both types of books that create new books and meaning in physically altering what's already been formed and made. And the larger question that I want to be asking is what are people doing when they create altered books, whether they're 18th century extra illustrated books or 21st century artist books. This talk will be mainly about the 18th century extra illustrated book. Um, so to give you an overview of my talk, I'll be beginning with a history of the 18th century extra illustrated book. I'll be addressing their origins, how they are made, how people engaged and interacted with them as material objects, and how they constitute a new multimedia form of writing. And that's a particular perspective that I bring to this topic. Um, I'll be showing examples from research and curatorial work that I've done in different rare book collections. So the second part will be devoted, and this part will be much shorter, will be devoted to um, Tom Phillips's A Human Mint, which is a foundational example of this type of artist book known as an altered book. And I'll be addressing how it was made, uh, what its features and formal elements are, as well as finally, the distinctions, resonance, and similarities between it and 18th century extra illustrated book. So the last part will be mainly a um, I'm, I'll stop talking at this point and I'll open it up to a larger discussion. Um, and I'm hoping it'll be a joint reflection on the bigger questions that are raised in comparing extra illustrated books with artist books, like some of the examples that we'll have looked at by then. Um, the, the other questions I wanna get at are how do altered books throughout different time periods that add extra visual elements, um, how do these types of books complicate how we answer such questions as what is writing and how is writing done? And of course, for book historians, the eternal question is, what is a book? Um, what do extra illustrated books show us about artist books and what do artist books show us about extra illustrated books? And this sort of reflexivity will run throughout my talk of different um, book formats from different historical periods. So artist books are like extra illustrated books because they blur conceptual boundaries between books and art objects through their material formats and designs. Artist books ask questions like, or they sort of raise questions like, is a book a container for words or is a book an artwork? And um, as I, when I pose those questions, I'm reminded of the definition that is provided by Ben Denzer, the book artist Ben Denzer, from whom I, I took a class at the Center for Book Arts. Um, and for Denzer, an artist book is a book or book-like object that does not describe or reproduce artwork but is an artwork in and of itself. So with that definition in mind, um, my approach to an artist's book is that it's a type of book or book-like object that highlights and invites explorations of books as artifacts. Artist books also self-consciously develop a language that's based on word and image relationships. Not only this, they use multimedia forms of expression, 
um, not just word and visual relationships, but also different media like sculpture and film. So the final thing I want to say about the larger relationships or the larger ties between extra illustrated books and artist books is that they both locate creativity in acts of destruction and revision, um, acts of destroying and revising books. So there is an underlying element of violence that I think is worth keeping in mind. Um, and it also redefines what creativity is. So the first example that I wanna show you of an artist book is the one that I referred to earlier, Tom Phillips's A Human Mint, um, which he created from 1966 to 2016. And this is an altered book that transforms a Victorian novel into essentially a long picture book. So it's basically a picture book that's the length of a novel. That's how I define it. And, or that's how I would describe it. And he um, created this book using William Burroughs's cut up technique, whereby he sought to eliminate, quote, unwanted words from the original text. And I'll be talking more about this later. The next example of an artist's book that proceeds through altering prior books is William Kentridge's Dismember Dictionaries and Textbooks. And um, so these books are filled with pages that are covered by his charcoal drawings. And these, these books are remediated and made animate by these video presentations. So the images on the pages and also the words that he um, inscribes on the pages become, they, they start to move. And um, I think that that description is quite enticing. So I thought that I might give you um, a sense of how this works by taking some time to look at a video sample of this technique or this model of Kentridge's work. Okay, I'll end there. And the next example I wanted to show you is Brian Detmer's um, Altered Books, um, which basically turns a book into an elaborate sculpture. Um, he calls this technique, the technique he uses, a technique of subtraction. So that sort of reminds, that um, recalls Phillips's example. And he also calls this technique a technique of reading with blades. Another example is Jonathan Safran Foer's Tree of Codes from 2010. Like Tom Phillips, um, Foer took a specific literary work, uh, a collection of short stories by Bruno Schultz, Street of Crocodiles from 1934, and his manner of reworking it um, used the constraints that were presented by the original piece of work. And his technique, as you can see here, um, entails cutting out words using a die cut printing method. Um, in doing so, he said that he was able to find a story within Schultz's story by carving away the great number of the words in order to have with the remaining words a different story. Um, and last, he said that what he was pursuing with this book was seeing what's possible with paper. Okay, and I think that those quotations from Foer are, will really resonate throughout this talk. What I want to say about all these examples is the key idea I'd like to have um, everyone to take away from this talk is that an earlier tradition of altering books precedes artist books like these 
And that earlier tradition resides in 18th century England. Okay, so I'm getting to the next section of my talk. Um, from 1770 to early 20th century, the early 20th century, it became a popular pastime for readers to supplement the pages of their books with engraved prints that they acquired from other sources. And here's, a, here's my first example of an extra illustrated um, book page opening, and I'll keep bringing this up. Um, I think that for a lot of you, the look of an extra illustrated book or pages from an extra illustrated book will seem unfamiliar and it'll be sort of hard to grasp what makes it interesting or different from other books. And um, that's what I want to point out is that one way to understand what the technique of extra illustration entails is to compare it with a scrapbook. So like scrap, as one does with a scrapbook, one um, compiles paper materials from other sources and pastes them onto the page of a blank book. Um, unlike the scrapbook, the extra illustrated book takes a book that already has words printed on them, a book that's been published, and finds um, ways to interleave the pages of that previously published book with new pages and, um, and this is also very key. The signs of these new, I wanna say intrusions onto an earlier book are made to, seem, um, made to seem invisible. So you're not supposed to be able to detect that a book has been extra illustrated. And I think that you can agree with me that it's hard to tell that this book has been extra illustrated. I mean, all the elements on this page have been cut out from other sources and pasted onto them, um, onto the pages. So it's my goal um, for you at the end of this talk to be able to understand how pages like this look. I mean, what makes them work as extra illustrative book pages and what's going on when um, someone decides to treat a book in this manner. Um, so, the, there are several or about four different types of book genres that were often used in the 18th century as books that people wanted to or decided to extra illustrate. And um, these book genres include historical biography um, or historical autobiography, which this book title suggests, local history and travel, antiquarian guides on ancient material uh, remains of England's past. And these material remains include um, buildings or artifacts. And the artifacts themselves include things like coins, heraldry, and funerary inscriptions that are found in specific areas of England. So these antiquarian tour guidebooks will are focused on different parts of England. Um, and you'll see an example of the coins that I'm talking about here on this page. And last, the, another type of book that was often extra illustrated were works by Shakespeare. So all these different types of book genres that I just described, um, if you think about it, they all have one thing in common, which is that they're all dealing with England's cultural heritage. So one can say that when one is um, engaging with the act of extra illustrating a book or when people in 18th century England were extra illustrating books, they are engaged in a pro project of preserving cult cultural heritage as well as immersing themselves in it and studying it quite closely. Um, so the addition of engravings didn't just work to illustrate a book. Um, I want to point out that something else is going on too. Um, the book transforms as, an, as a book object into something else. The book becomes a storehouse. It also becomes an album, um, mainly because the books turned into, the extra illustrated book turned into a place in which someone who had a big print collection could store their prints. And um, 
I want to point out that prints were intentionally acquired and collected precisely for the purpose of extra illustrating books. And it was a prestigious hobby for upper, upper class men. And it became a channel for collecting engravings. Um, and I'll talk about this towards the end of the talk later. I'll talk more about this. The men themselves did not do the actual work of unbinding and rebinding books and cutting paper and gluing prints into them. If you can imagine what was involved in extra illustrating a book, it does sound like quite a, a physical and messy activity. Um, but even if they weren't the ones to do this work themselves, it's, um, it was an activity that promoted a sense of awareness about how books are made and remade and transformed through manual craftsperson techniques. And the material consequences were very visible and physical as well as conceptual. So you weren't just expanding and, um, a book through extra illustrating it, you're also heightening a book's multi-dimensional identity. Um, extra illustration heightens the book's identity as a textual object, a material object, and a visual object. So as I um, mentioned earlier, there's actually an earlier religious um, tradition of extra illustrating books. Um, there are earlier examples from the 17th century um, called the Little Gideon Concordances, which the scholar Whitney Tretien has written an article on, and she also has um, a website devoted to this work. Um, so there, there is an earlier example, but that work didn't start the craze that Granger's work did. Um, and so for a long period of time, People weren't extra illustrating until the 1770s. Um, and this is when Granger's book came out. Here's a picture of Granger. It's a frontispiece for his book. He was born in 1723 and he died in 1776. In 1769, he published what he called a methodical catalog. Um, that actually sounds really boring, doesn't it? And the, tit the title of the book was a biographical history of England. And, um, and it's worth taking the time to explain what this book actually was and what it was intended to do. It was meant to be a guide to help readers put together a collection of portrait engravings of notable figures in English history. So excuse me. in order to catalog the engravings, he organized his entries around the historical figures. Um, this seemed like the easiest way to organize the data, the information, um, instead of having a list of different print and great prints with their um, printers and names of the artists and names of the prints, he decided to organize this catalog around the actual figures who are being represented in the prints. And um, so that was a very popular subject in engraved prints during this time. The engraved prints often depicted or showed people from the past, their portraits, and these portraits were called heads. So um, this book contains these short biographical summaries and it's important to note that it was a book of four volumes in quarto format, which means that it's Originally, it was originally nine and a half inches long, and the book itself was completely void of illustrations. Um, the only illustration in it was this lovely frontispiece of Granger, and um, it wasn't even meant to be filled with illustrations. It's sort of an accident that this turned into the the beginning of extra illustration. Um, so clever readers like Richard Bull saw in this guide a material structure for arranging and storing his print collection. So Bull started out with a print collection. Uh, he had Granger's book because he wanted to have, you know, a nice collection of prints. And he hit on this idea that what he could do is affix the engraved portraits from his collection directly into the pages of Granger's book. And 
what this is really akin to is our form of hyperlinking, um, where you're often, I think in today's digital culture, you, you're often attaching a visual image of something to text as a way of understanding something better and making information more engaging. And Richard Bull in the 1770s realized you know, that you could do this, but with paper. Um, so for this reason, the fact that this started with Granger's Biographical History of England, this activity is now known as Grangerizing. To treat a book in this manner is to Grangerize it. But the word Grangerize itself wasn't used until 1882. Uh, the verb extra illustrate wasn't used until 1879. In Granger's and Bull's time, the word illustrate was used. That's what they said they were doing when they were extra illustrating books. They were illustrating it. So it was after Bull started doing this, the extra illustration craze took off. Um, so what happens to a book when you stuff it with extra pictures? I think the obvious answer is that its body increases. The book becomes fat and bulky. Um, and it's sort of amazing to consider just how fat and bulky a book would become if you had 14,500 prints and drawings as Richard Bull did. That's how many prints and drawings he had in his collection. Um, so what ended up happening was that he radically transformed Stranger's book from four quarto volumes to 36 elephant size volumes. Um, um, I have to add that Richard Bull was a master of parliament and it said that he didn't do very much as a master of parliament, but just hearing the number about the number of prints and drawings he had and the number of volumes, he, extra illustrated volumes he created, you can understand why he perhaps didn't do very much as an MP. He was quite busy with his extra illustration um, projects. So not just the extent of the book, but the scale of the book grew too. It went from nine and a half, being nine and a half inches long to 22 inches long. And these are just some examples from the pages from um, the Bull Granger. That's what the book is now known as and it's housed at the Huntington Library. And um, you'll see here the way that these don't really look like pages from a book, um, what I think that they look like or what they remind me of are, these are sort of like display cases that you might find in an exhibition um, gallery. And so you can see here, this is, these are pages that are depicting a his, one historical figure and you could see her face, her image repeated throughout between the two pages you'll see the piece of text that's cut out of um, Granger's book and pasted onto the new page. And you'll see the link that connects the text to the image. And these links are really fascinating. There's something, it's like a piece of decoupage. And um, it sort of heightens the sense of the artifactual quality of an extra illustrated page. Um, and you'll see better what I mean by this example. The, the coins are arrayed on this page um, and they're connected to the historical figure who's represented here, King Henry. That's something else that Granger advised in his book, which is that he encouraged people to collect point, coins and not just um, these portrait heads of figures from English history because he said that historical knowledge can also be obtained through collecting coins. And so you, one could say that you're, you know, Bull wasn't just displaying his collection, but he's, there's also a pedagogical um, aspect to these pages that he created. So like um, a rare books or museum curator, he's uh, compiling all the different pieces of a different subject matter and putting them on one page or one site and showing their connections in order, in order to create a better understanding of the subject. 
Um, okay, so another really famous example is the Sutherland Clarendon, that's what it's known as. You'll see the extra illustrated title page to, I think it's your right, my left, and um, the original title, title page to your left. And the scale of this image is misleading. Um, the extra illustrated page is about three times larger than the original title page. And this is a work that was created by Alexander and Charlotte Sutherland. They were a couple, a married couple. Um, Alexander Pendrus Sutherland died and Charlotte Sutherland took over and completed this monumental project of turning three folio sized volumes, um, that was Clarendon's original work, to 61 elephant folio volumes. And I'm just showing a picture of the glass covered bookcases that were custom designed to house these extra illustrated books that are now in the Ashmolean print room. And um, this bookcase lines the back wall that's behind the print room attendant's desk. And it's a quite a small room. Um, and I think that one can speculate why um, I won't have much time to go into this right now, but why were these books moved from the Bodleian Library where they were originally donated by Charlotte Sutherland in 1837 to a different repository altogether, the, um, the Ashmolean Museum. And I think that that move is really representative of the sort of tension that I find um, connects the extra illustrated book with the artist book. Um, it really shows how there's great ambiguity in the extra illustrated book about whether or not it's an artwork or if it's a book. It moved, this migrated from a library to being housed in a print and drawing room. Um, and the same confusion takes place with the Bull Granger. And I'll explain this by telling a personal story about what it was like for me to request to see the Bull Granger through um, the Aeon system at the Huntington. I went to the, the reading room desk to pick up the book that I ordered or what I thought was the book. And um, the reading room attendant said, you don't have any books waiting for you. You only have these manuscript boxes. And, you know, I was ready to argue with her because I was convinced I was supposed to be seeing a big, you know, important book. And it turned out that in fact, the Bull Granger is now housed in archival boxes. The whole um, 31 volume book has been unbounded and all the different pages are stored as print, loose prints inside boxes. And the reason why this was done was because um, this is actually one of the most frequently requested book for readers to look at at the Huntington. And through so many um, usages by readers, it started to fall apart. And the curator at the time of Rare Books had to make a decision. And he decided that the best way to preserve this book was to, um, I guess, rob its identity as a book. Um, and, you know, I think my whole experience of engaging with the Bull Granger was, I felt quite different from how it felt to engage with the Sutherland Clarendon. Um, but it's important to point out that books of this size, engaging with books of this size, it's impossible or very difficult not to damage them somehow um, from interacting with them. And um, to get back to what I was saying earlier about the move from the Bodleian to the small print room of the Ashmolean, I think it makes sense that it was moved here also because the reading room is smaller and um, people working in the reading room can keep a closer eye on the readers and to see how they're actually turning the pages of the book. In fact, I yelled at quite a lot for not turning the pages of the Southern Clarendon properly or carefully enough. Um, so this last example that I wanna show is from the repository that I work at, which is the, um, at NYU, which is the 18th century folio edition of John Stowe's Survey of London, which was edited, or as he put it, corrected, improved, and enlarged by John Stipe. 
in the 18th century. Um, Stowe's work was originally published in the late 16th century. And again, I was confused when I was um, researching this book. Um, it's going to be in the interactive book exhibition because the first volume I noticed actually didn't have any extra illustrated images. All of the engravings in it were made, excuse me, expressly for Stowe's survey. Um, I discovered when I opened up an archival box that was part of the book, um, these loose prints and pamphlets that were stored loosely. And I found out from having a conversation with the conservator for special collections, Lou de Janeiro, that this treatment was requested by the curator at the time. Um, the book, the first volume was falling apart because so many prints were stuffed into it and something had to be done to preserve the book. And the curator at the time decided that um, the best way to treat the book was to retain, ha revert the first volume back to its original condition as a pure, un un unadulterated Stowe survey of London. Um, fortunately, and so here, here are the two different bindings for this book. Um, and but fortunately, the second volume was left in good enough condition that the original extra illustrated prints were left intact. And you could see how they look in these slides. And I hope you're getting some ideas about what it might be like to engage with an um, extra illustrated book and the sorts of mechanisms that are involved in, in looking or reading at um, a book like this. And all these stories add up to um, a picture of what the afterlife of extra illustrated books um, what sort of issues this afterlife poses or questions it raises for conservators and curators who have to wrestle with these issues constantly in order to allow these books to have continued interaction. Um, these questions are, what are you being asked to preserve? What do you end up destroying in the very process of preservation? And what kind of records of the past are being effaced? And as I was asking these questions, thinking that they were specific to conservators and curators, I realized, wait a minute, these actually mirror the questions that extra illustrators were in fact facing and make, you know, they were making very similar decisions. Um, so there are consequences in the reading experience. And, I've just shown you some examples of radically expanded books or books that are radically expanded by the process of extra illustration. And um, you'll see in this example here that different elements could be added to an extra illustrated book, not just flat prints, um, but also pieces of paper that you might say are more like objects rather than um, flat sheets of paper, pieces of paper. Um, and those pamphlets that I just referred to earlier in NYU Stowe's survey is an example of that sort of added element to an extra illustrated book or an added artifact. Um, so what happens when you're encountering pages like this that are actually really kind of complex paper objects is that time expands and slows down when you're reading an extra illustrated book. Um, a new, it creates a new textual journey that demands tact tactile and visual encounters with new pages of often heavier weight page paper. And that's in fact, that in fact is what leads to damage um, in the long term. Um, I thought it would be instructive to show a video, um, this really wonderfully helpful video that the Huntington, Huntington made to accompany their 2013 exhibition on extra illustrative books. Um, by the way, they have this enormous collection, uh, but this is really the best way to demonstrate what I'm talking about.
okay. So um, that was an example of a 19th century book. So it's not exactly like looking through an 18th century extra illustrated book, but it gives you enough of a sense of the slowness with, that's required um, for looking through an extra illustrated book. I find that the only way that you can read an extra illustrated book quickly is by only focusing on one medium. So you could either focus on text alone or focus on images, but it's impossible to interrelate the two um, and engage with a book quickly. So the new interleavings that are found in extra illustrated books are often oversized and folded into the book in order to fit inside of it, like the ones that I showed earlier from NYU. Um, they require reader, readers to change the rhythm of reading words to look at images instead um, in the process of unfolding and turning the page. You're much more conscious and ha of having to unfold foldouts. You're much more conscious of the book as a physical object. And I find that this disruption to the rhythm can introduce wonder um, over the scale of the image, the, uh, the scale of an image that is presented as a foldout suggests the significance of the subject or the beauty and novelty of the print itself. And here's an example from the Southern Clarendon. Um, and it's a genealogical tree print of the royal progeny of the most famous kings of England. And you'll see here that it bears um, the organic qualities that it represents conceptually. So like a tree or um, something that's growing, it, this print has portrait roundels of English rulers that are nestled inside a network of branches or stems, actually that looks more like a vine, and, and leaves. Um, and it grows when unfolded well beyond the length of the elephant sized volume in which it's interleaved onto the table in the print room. And here's another example which is um, this mezzotint portrait of the Earl of Stafford that was tipped into, the, and that's, the, that's the technical term for putting a print into a book um, via the process of extra illustration. And it's called, it's referred to as a process of tipping a print in. So tipping, tipped into the Clark Library's 18th century extra illustrated copy of Evelyn's 17th century memoirs is, um, the Earl of Stafford, who just kind of jumps out at you as you're reading this um, rather dry, prosaic diary entry about Evelyn meeting him with him on that day. And the, um, so here the subject's social status seems to correspond with the size of the, of the page that his image appears on, and it exceeds the proportions of the volume that contains this print. In this way, um, these examples show that foldouts heighten the interactive engagement with the book as an object. And it also shows that interactivity continues after the act of making the extra illustrated volume. And I'll be talking more about this process of making um, and the interactivity of it. Lastly, these foldouts augment the book's multidimensionality. They show that textual experience and documents are not linear, flat, and based on words alone. In fact, they can be layered, interactive, and based as much on images as on text. Um, so given all this, I want to get to this question of authorship. Is it fair to say that an extra illustrated work is as much the creation of the book owner as it is of the original author. And I think answers to this question can be found in the title page of the Bull Granger. Um, just to go back to this slide, you'll see here that it's a visually exuberant and architectural title page. It was lettered and drawn with these um, Gothic ornaments by Bull's daughters. Catherine and Elizabeth. You'll see here that Bull called his work series of engraved British heads from Egbert the Great to the Revolution, rather than the original title um, by Granger, which was 
biographical history of England from Egbert the Great to the Revolution. Um, so the only thing that remains consistent is the chronological time span as represented by the different historical figures. But Bull, in calling his book a series of en engraved British heads, remember heads means portraits, um, is really emphasizing the visual element of his book um, rather than the textual element, which is highlighted by Granger when he calls his book a biographical history. So, and furthermore, the authorial byline is not attributed to Granger. Um, you don't really see Granger's name on this title page. Instead, you see Richard Bull's initials. And when in his byline, he's adapting what I feel is language that evokes um, today's archival processing. He refers to his act of creation as the whole collected and ranged in chronological order. So um, there's rearrangement of Granger's original title here that conveys not so much an act of co-authorship, but an act of appropriation. What, what Bull is doing here is transmitting um, Granger's text through the perspective of a different creator, him. Um, and the ultimate sign of this authorship can be found in this prominent placement that you'll see at the bottom of the title page of the Bull family coat of arms. The scholars use the word co-author for extra illustrator and co-publisher as the scholar and curator Gabrielle Dean does. Um, she wrote an important article in 19th century extra illustrated books. Scholars agree more or less over this term of co-authorship, but what I want to ask is, what does this term mean in relationship to the intermedial qualities of extra illustration? On what basis can you apply the role of author, which is a term that's used for textual works, to a creative product that uses visual image even more than words themselves? Are you still writing as well as authoring something when you're cutting and pasting visual objects onto a page or having these acts done for you as opposed to forming words on it with a tool, which is a, the more traditional understanding of writing? And so I want to try to get at this, these questions by looking at the craft method, the method of craft that's used for making extra illustrated books. Um, the physical procedure of extra illustration hasn't really been well documented, but it really does seem like an important part of the new form of authorship and writing that extra illustration entails. So one is crafting meaning through extra illustration. And these signs of craft can be found in the cut lines of prints, <coughs> excuse me, and glue marks that are left, um, that are quite prominent here. In the example to your right, which is from the Clark Library's um, Extra Illustrated Evelyn's Memoirs, um, it's more delicately done in the example to your left, which is the title page for um, the Sutherland Clarendon. And indeed, the Sutherland Clarendon was regarded as really the height of craftsmanship for extra illustrated books. Other remnants or signs of um, the craftsmanship that was put into extra illustrating books is not just found in these blue marks. Um, again, here I just want to pause to point out that so it's usually behind these extra illustrated pages that you can see the signs of, of the glue, but usually the front, I mean, this is a really well done version, it's William Beckford's extra illustrated copy of um, Du Sorel's um, Anglo-Norman Antiquities. But in the example to your left, you can see it's barely visible, but often these um, pages in the back show reveal blue marks like the example to, to your right. Other examples or other signs of the craftsmanship is um, are these penciled in marks or notes for both the extra illustrator and the 
craftsperson in the bookbinder business who is often hired to do the work of cutting and pasting um, print into extra illustrated books. Um, the book owner would be in charge of, would be the one to collect the prints and decide where they should go, but um, different people were usually involved um, for executing the extra illustration. The earlier, when extra illustration first emerged as a popular late 18th century activity, the production was usually undertaken in private households. So as I mentioned earlier, Bull's daughters, Catherine and Elizabeth, lettered the title page for his extra illustrated Granger. Uh, but they also did the cutting and pasting for their father. And I think that what this, this domestic, the domestic origins of early extra illustration suggests the deeply personal and tactile level of connection between extra, extra illustrators and books. A lot of care was taken to learn the skills for rearranging and preserving prints and texts into books to make essentially new ones. Um, and the last thing I want to go over is that not only the craftsmanship um, generated a level of authorship, but also the, the formal aspect that you've been seeing all throughout this talk, which is the way in which extra illustrated book pages are often seen um, through a frame. And this frame was called, these were called windows. Um, and I argue that framing and these acts of framing and making windows for prints that are inserted into books um, written by other people is an act of ownership. And because they create a new perspective and um, this is a, this is a conceptual idea that um, Irving Goffman explores in his, in his frame theory. So I'd like to show this video, one last video of what's entailed in um, making these windows. And there's a technical reason for why these windows and frames were made. It really produced a much more refined product, extra illustrated book product, because um, it just allowed less buckling of the page. If one were to affix the print to a backing, um, that's what the blank page underneath was called, um, one would run into a situation where all the pages in the book start to buckle from the glue, the expansive glue that's applied. In inlaying a print or making a window for it, you're um, creating much less glue usage. And I'll just show a short video. It shows how this, how this is done.
Okay. So th this ex um, this technique of beveling a page or beveling paper to create a window frame is called chamfering, C-H-A-M-F-E-R. Um, and that's actually a technique that's used, it's a term that's used in carpentry and architecture. So I want to move from um, 18th century extra illustrated books to my final example of altered books, which is Tom Phillips's A Human Mint. And you'll see windows coming up here as well. Uh, this book began in 1966. And it began as a challenge, a creative challenge that Phillips set up for himself, which was to find a second hand book for three pence and alter every page with visual media. And these media included painting, collage, and cut up technique. And the book that he found was this 1892 novel called Human Document by W.H. Mallock which by Phillips's time, um, 1966, was unknown, but during Malick's time was a bestseller. Um, so I guess you can imagine that there are many copies of this book available. The earliest version of um, Phillips's altered version of Malick's book appeared in manuscript form in 1971 and 1976. It, was acquired by a trade press and was published by Thames and Hudson with Hans Jörg Mayer in 1980. And um, five more revised editions appeared in 1987, 1998, 2004, 2012, and 2016. And it's, um, I mean, that detail alone about the revised editions appearing is really evokes a lot of different um, ideas. And I think that the one idea that I find so arresting about this technique is that Phillips didn't just set about, he didn't just look through his book and decide he wanted to change some things, but he set up another challenge, which, a new challenge, which was to replace um, 50 of the pages in the prior version with 50 new pages in each edition. So by the end of creating all these different editions with the final edition, um, the goal would be achieved, and these are his words, in which no page of the earliest version survives. So I think that that's really quite interesting because in these examples of extra illustrated books from the 18th century, it's really sort of hard to detect um, the original book from through the process of extra illustration. The original book becomes so transformed. And here's an example. I'll just show some slides of um, a human mint and then I'll end my, my talking. Um, so you can see here the way in which Phillips proceeds through subtracting, covering over the words written by Malloch and um, creating a new flow through the words. And he's showing that writing can be moved through in a different fashion. It doesn't have to be linear, but it can be actually curvilinear. And I took um, Ronnie's altered page class, which I think people should take because it, it enacts this um, process of altering a page as it's modeled by Phillips. And Ronnie called it a process of moving through a page. Like how do you map out the way that you can move through a page if you approach the page as something that's visual and not just linguistic. And in doing so, new linguistic meaning can be produced and you can see the different wordplay that um, you know, that, that Phillips is enacting here. And there are some elements that are very similar to the Bull Granger. I see um, it here in the way that he isolates a small box of the original text and places it in a new space. Um, and just going through some more examples, you can see how a lot of the words that Phillips um, highlights are words that have to do with books 
And so it seems that, you know, in altering Malik's book, he's really calling attention to um, what bookmaking is and how it's actually done through destroying another book. And, you know, th this isn't a nice thing to do with a book, to a book. Um, to this day, I can't bring myself to actually extra illustrate a book, even though I keep on telling myself that I should in order to practice embodied research. But there are also elements here that really evoke the extra illustrated book page. Um, I like how on this page in particular, Phillips in showing this shelf of books on top of um, this other section of the page, he's suggesting that in altering a book, you're actually uncovering a whole library of new books. Um, if you're creating these new patterns and new sentences and new meanings through effacing and covering over uh, the uh, covering over the original pages of someone else's book. Um, and here's a, I guess the final example that really brings us home is this particular page opening from my copy of A Human Mint. Um, and the page to your left is sort of like this is the embodiment of the final edition of a human mint in that every single page, every single word of a page has been wiped out. But in having this page face the one to your right, um, this suggests that in doing this, a new, a window is made um, and the page itself is, becomes a window. So again, this is also bringing up extra illustrated book pages in their windows. Um, and this is reinforced by the fact that this page is identifying itself as a window. This is a speaking page that's saying right here, I am the window your dream stepped out of. So with that, I um, want to end this talk by pointing out the ways in which both extra illustrated books and altered books from um, artist books from the 20th and 21st centuries create new windows of meaning and um, new worlds through this process of extra illustration and alteration, which um, necessitates the destruction and reformation of prior forms. And I just want to end this talk by bringing us back to the first slide. I hope by looking at these two pages, um, two book formats next to each other again, you feel that you have a better idea of what kind of artifactual, um, historical artifacts these are and how they're related to each other um, conceptually and formally. And um, so I'd love to talk more about what you think about this relationship between these two different book formats and what questions arise for you. Um, Julie, we do have a 